This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Just a moment. Father, in that powerful, majestic, worthy, and deserving name of Jesus, we come to you today, God, not, not in form and fashion, but to really pray out of the concerns of our own heart. God, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will change us individually as your servants, as your children. Change us. Do something in us before you attempt to do something through us, God. Change us. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray in the name of Jesus that you will send a revival of miracles. Shekra baboskatas. A revival of miracle, your miracle power manifesting itself in the lives of your precious people, God. In every household that's represented, God, even in this place, this watching online, God, we pray in the name of Jesus that you'll begin to move, God. I pray, Father, for scholarships for sons and daughters. I pray for advancements on the job. I pray for divine ideas. I pray for a revival of miracles, of healings, of bodies, of bones, of heart conditions, of uh, liver conditions, God, of pancreatic conditions, of diabetes in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray that you'll send a revival of miracles, miracles over mental disorders. Bipolar disorders, God, uh, paranoia in the name of Jesus, schizophrenia, all kinds of psychotic disorders, dementia, and uh, Alzheimer's in the name of Jesus. Father, that men and women, Father, will just start snapping back into their minds, God, into their right minds by the supernatural power of God. We pray for miracles that are irrefutable, but that medicine will be able to confirm and say, surely this is the Lord's work. We pray for a revival of miracles, miracles, miracles of hope rising up on the inside of us, God, of being able to have clarity of vision and understanding what you've called us to do, what you've empowered us to do. God, by your power, may you strengthen heads of households today to be able to lead in a godly way. I pray, Father, that your wisdom will so infuse your people that you will give us clarity and strategy, God, that will produce a victory that will ultimately bring glory back to you. Father, we declare in the name of Jesus that all of the wonderful things that you do in our lives as you bring us into this season of divine restoration, of divine multiplication in the name of Jesus, that you will bring also strategic divine connections, God, in the name of Jesus in this year. We speak it and declare it that your power, God, as a revival of miracles will rise up in the name of Jesus. Do the work, God, where you put your signature on various things and say, surely this is the Lord's doing. And I pray, God, that you will anoint our ears and hearts and minds to be able to hear your word today and apply our hearts to wisdom that we might further glorify your name in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You may be seated. So good to see you today. So good to have you tuning in today. We thank God that no matter what's happening in our society, no matter what's happening with our weather, that Jesus is still Lord. He's still on the throne. He's still ruling and super ruling. And we celebrate the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Uh, my scriptural text today, it comes from 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. I've taught this verse for a number of years. I've taught this verse for the last 40 years. 2 Timothy 2.15, it simply says, work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. And I'm speaking here from the subject, learn to earn, learn to earn. Now, I, I memorized this verse as a young teenager uh, years ago in the King James Version, which we call the poetic version. 
the King James Version, it puts it this way. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study to learn. Study to learn. Learn to earn. Study to, to learn. The only reason that we study things is so we can learn it. So that we get it. Study to learn. We learn to earn. If your learning doesn't produce earning, then we've missed something. Uh, the Bible says that a man ought to study his wife so that he might dwell with her according to knowledge. In other words, you've got you to study homegirl in order to know homegirl so you can deal with her peacefully. You've got to understand how she's wired, how she thinks. Study her. She's your study project. Study uh, to, to learn her. Once you learn her, then now you can earn a certain respect that comes. Study to learn, learn to earn, learn to earn, learn to earn. It says study to show yourself a, a workman unto God. Study to show yourself approved, approved, approved. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study to show yourselves approved. Just study, study. You're only studying something so that you can learn it. You only want to learn something so you can earn something as a result of your learning. I don't like just intellectualism for the sake of just being smart if it never translates into earning respect, earning honor, earning, uh, you know, um, compliance into an organization. You know, in every entity, there are unspoken rules. There are unspoken rules in every family that, you know, if you're going to be in this family, you know, you can't come in here and cut the food. You know, you may cuss somebody else out, but you ain't going to talk to my mama like that. And, and that may be an unspoken rule. It's just an unspoken rule. You've got to learn the rules of the game. And if you want to earn acceptance and approval into that family, you're going to have to study the rules of that family. And some of those rules are unspoken. And in every organization, in every fraternity, in every sorority, there are rules. In life, there are rules. There is a culture for every organization. There's a culture in every church. There's a culture in every family, in every village, in every tribe. There is a culture. These cultures operate by rules. Somebody has to teach you the rules of the game so that you don't offend the culture. Offend the tribe. That's why you learn to earn. You learn to earn. Back in, in, in the day, they would take young men through this program of, of uh, rituals and intense kinds of experiences which was their journey into masculinity and manhood they were learning to earn the respect of being called a man it wasn't just a given you had to study you had to learn something in order to earn the respect to say now this is a delineation between boyhood and manhood that was a process they took men on a journey you study to learn you learn to earn Turn your learning into earning. Wouldn't it be powerful if you could take all of those million dollar ideas and, and, and download them into your bank account? Uh, learn to earn. Learn to earn. Learn to earn. Now, I want you to notice here, it says to work hard so you can present yourselves to God. Our first working is not to impress man, it's to be acceptable to God. As a human being, as a man, as a woman, I want to work so that I can be acceptable to God. I want to be acceptable to God. If I don't win anybody's favor, I want to be acceptable to God. If they don't like me on my job, in my circle, in my small group, I want to be acceptable unto God. I want to present myself to God and receive his approval. Listen, when you get the approval of God, you'll actually have the approval of human beings that you need. When you get the approval of God, you'll automatically have the approval of the human beings that you need. And so it says, be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed, and one who correctly explains the word of truth. Now, if, they didn't, if there were not people who were incorrectly explaining the word of truth, he wouldn't have to put this qualifier in here. 
No, not everybody who say, man, it looked, it seemed like to me. Everybody has an opinion. Uh, and everybody has the right to speak, but you have to earn the right to be heard. And so notice this. I want you to see here, acceptance and approval are not the same. Acceptance is the act of receiving something or someone. Acceptance. It's just the act of receiving something or someone. That's, that's all it is. Acceptance. I receive it. We accept you into this group. We accept you into this family. At every marriage, a wedding, there is an acceptance into the family. Well, now you're our son. Now you're our daughter. There's an acceptance. It's just the act of receiving someone. Acceptance. We want to be received. But you see, with God, it's not just about being accepted by God just as we are. You come to God just as you are. You don't have to uh, fix up and clean up to come to God. God will accept you in your dirty, filthy, sin-laden, addiction-bound condition. God will accept you however you are. Your twisted up thinking, all of your issues, all of your confusion, your identity, all of that, God will accept you just the way that you are. But he will never leave you the way that he, you are. You see, he accepts you the way that you are, and then he transforms you. Once you get the transformation, now you get his approval. And it takes the power of the word of God to do that. Now listen, when you just accept someone, here's what happened. When you accept someone, you don't try to control the feelings of others. When you accept them, sometimes if you have children, you just have to accept them just the way that they are. You, you don't try to control the feelings of others. You allow others to be different. When you accept someone, you allow others to be different. You have to realize that they're different than me. They're different than my generation. And you're not quick to judge. You're not quick to judge. When you accept someone, you're not quick to judge them. When you accept someone, you give thoughtful advice to them. You accept them, but you just give thoughtful advice. And then you try not to compare. So here's, here's what you do when you accept someone. You don't try to control the feelings of other people. You allow others to be different. You're not quick to judge. You give thoughtful advice and you try not to compare. That's about acceptance. I accept you just the way you are. You can come broken, fractured, messed up, and all of that, and you're just accepted. People can fall in love with you before they even understand your story. And once they learn your story, they have to say, they have to make a decision whether I'm going to accept you into going into this journey and whatever this might mean for me or whether I'm going to reject this. But if I'm going to accept you, these are, these are some of the terms that you have to use in, in terms of accepting. Uh, you can accept people without approving their behavior. You can accept people without approving their lifestyle because you may never agree with it. You may never agree with it. So uh, acceptance is not approval. It is not approval. There are many parents and we have to accept our children unconditionally, just as we should. But then it doesn't mean that the child automatically has the approval of the parent. So acceptance and approval are two different things. Here's approval. Approval is an indication of agreement or an acknowledgement that a person or a thing or an event meets requirements. That's approval. That's approval. When you're producing something on an assembly line, that's what approval is. It, it's saying that this meets the requirements. This, you, you're approved. If you're going into the military, there's, you, you've got to be tested. You've got to go through boot camp. And, and you have to meet certain minimum requirements. And so once you meet those requirements, that means that you are then approved. But just because uh, you go in and, and fill out an application online or wherever... Just because you feel the application out does not mean that you are approved as an employee. They will accept your application. They will accept your loan application. That doesn't mean that the loan is approved. So acceptance and approval are two different things. Now notice our foundational text is saying study, study, study for what purpose so you can learn. Learn for what purpose so that you can show yourselves approved so that you can be approved by God. Approved, not accepted, approved. God wants us to be able to grow and to develop, learn something, earn something so that we then meet a certain requirement so that we are approved, approved. This is not uh, coming into salvation. This is not about salvation. God accepts us just as we 
are. Now, here's something that I, I love that the, that the um, philosopher Epictetus said. He says, you become what you give your attention to. You become what you give your attention to. You become what you give your attention to. And see, you have to know what to pay attention to in life. Don't give your attention to everything. There are some minutia. It doesn't, it's not worth it. Don't give your attention to it. Don't give your attention to responding to every email, to every text message, to every direct message. Just because somebody likes something, put a comment. You don't have to respond to everything. Some people get in trouble because you start responding to crazy stuff that comes out of people's mouths. You can't control what other people say, think, nor do. But you can control your response to it. So you become what you give your attention to. Don't give your attention to things that don't help you grow. Don't give your attention to things that don't in some way make you better. I mean, uh, if I'm going to give my attention, it means, at least make me laugh. At least I want to have a good time. If I, you know, I mean, I, you know, I mean, if I go out with somebody, I mean, if I'm, if I'm a single person, if I go out with you and if I don't, if I don't enjoy anything, you're not making me laugh and feel good or whatever. If I don't enjoy your company, it's, this is not going to happen again. Trust me, I'm not going to give my attention to that again. If it's awkward and I'm struggling trying to make a conversation, you know, this is, what is the first and the last time. I accepted this invitation, but I don't approve this. It's the difference between acceptance and approval. You have to know what to give your attention to you. You cannot pay attention to every barking dog. I used to deliver newspaper. I was on a job, you know, that was my job. I had to get my newspapers into those mailboxes in order to be able to go back and collect my money. And, and I dealt with barking dogs. I'm not that. If I let a, a barking dog stop me from delivering my newspaper, I can't collect my money. So I'm going to give my attention to getting my newspaper in the mailbox, not the dog. I never let a barking dog stop me from delivering my paper. You know, and I mean, I, I, I kept some rocks with me. I kept some stuff, you know. If I had to feel like I had to knock a dog's brains out, of like, you want to try me again, you know. Because I, when I first started out delivering newspapers, I was walking. And then I upgraded to a bicycle. Then I upgraded to a motorcycle. And I'm like, catch me if you can. Catch me if you can. And I, I just had a, you know, I, I had a blast just being able to allow them to chase me on my motorcycle. It was the thrill of my morning before I went to school. But I, 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 had, I had a job to do. And I wasn't going to let the barking dogs distract me. Uh, not everybody's criticism. You can't let that listen to it to let it derail you from where you're going because remember, you become what you give your attention to. Now let me just say this. Uh, I love something that Herbert Simon said. He said, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. A wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. You would assume that because of all of the incredible information that we have available to us on the internet, it has given us a wealth of information but a poverty of attention. A wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. That's why if you're going to be good in something, you can't give your attention to everything. you got to specialize in what you are called to do, what is pertinent to your assignment, and become a specialist in that and drill deep in that and not just master everything. Uh, Isaac Asimov said that the saddest aspect of life right now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. That's our problem. We're talking about learning to earn. The saddest aspect of life right now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to know what to do with knowledge. Wisdom is the application of the knowledge. And some people just can't do that because they have what's called an infected mind. You ever dealt with somebody with an infected mind? Have you ever dated somebody with an infected mind? Have you ever had to try to work with somebody and their mind is infected? You know what an infection does in a body, but what in the world do you think an infection does to a mind? And the worst thing that you can do is to marry somebody with a, with a mental infection. Marcus Aurelius said this, an affected mind is a far more dangerous pestilence than any plague. Only one threatens your life, the other destroys your character. 
Now think about that very carefully. This is talking about an infected mind. You have to be able to recognize people who have mental infection and, and avoid them like the plague because one, you know, natural plagues affect the body. They, they can threaten your life, but the other one destroys your character. A mental infection destroys your character. And I just want you to realize that as we walk with God, God leads us on a journey. And that journey takes us into the unknown, just like God called Abraham to get up and go into a land that he would show him. It's, he takes us on a journey into the unknown, and that journey into the unknown requires that we trust him. And on this journey called life, we inevitably learn as the journey is unfamiliar territory to us. Remember, the greatest lessons of life are not learned in a course, they are learned on a course. And that's why God will take you into new experiences that you've never dealt with before, new situations for which you don't have a manual that you can open up to say, what am I supposed to do here? You learn to earn the thinking capacity. Study so you can learn how to think. Not what to think, how to think. Real education doesn't teach you what to think. It teaches you how to think. Because on the journey, you're going to find a lot of unexpected situations and a lot of unknown situations. But it's okay as long as I can think through it and pray through it. If you have good praying ability and good thinking ability, you're going to be all right in any type of crisis. If you can pray right and think right, you're thinking as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If my thinking is clear, my identity is clear, my understanding is clear, my vision is clear, my mission is clear, my values are clear. If I can think through it, think through it, think through it. And so God will lead you on a journey to teach you some things that's not in the book. There are some lessons and tests that you learn on the journey. And those things teach us the most. I love something, you want to get a screenshot of this that Hal Elrod said. He said, your level of success will rarely exceed your level of personal development because success is something you attract by the person you become. That's heavy. Your level of success will rarely exceed your level of personal development. That's why you ought to study to learn, study to learn, study to show yourselves approved for your personal development because success is something that you attract by the person that you become. If you're impoverishing your thinking, you'll still attract small thoughts to you, small opportunities to you because you won't be able to get the big ones. You keep on attracting small ideas. Let me just tell you this, you can brighten and illuminate a situation much better than to have three 20 watt bulbs if you have one 100 watt bulb. The illumination of an 100 watt bulb does something different than just 20 watt. 20 watt bulbs can only illuminate 20 watt situations. You'll get 20 watt opportunities. You'll see 20 watt people, but when you get a hundred watt, bright lights draw other things. And the brighter the light, the more things that it starts to draw. And so you don't even realize that sometimes the situation is that you think that I just need more of these 20 watt friends around me. No, 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 no. you need a hundred watt. I, I, I never will forget, <laughs> we, we had a billionaire there and he was uh, approached by a guy who was a millionaire. And the, millionaire, the billionaire said to the millionaire, he said, tell, tell me something about your friends. He said, well, my friend is so-and-so. He's a millionaire. My other friend, he's so-and-so is a millionaire. And he said, so he's a millionaire. The billionaire stopped. He said, I, I, I see your problem right now. He said, all your friends are millionaires. He said, you don't have any billionaire friends. He says, you, you, you'll never become what you don't surround yourself with. I mean, the billionaire told him that. And, and the guy thought that he was doing something because all of his friends were millionaires. But see, again, those are all 20 watts. Study to show yourself approved because success is about what you attract on the basis of what you become. And when they start seeing certain uh, development, personal development of where you have studied, where you've become what is a rare species on the earth, if you become a man of God, a woman of God, 
in love with God and brilliant in concepts and ideas and strategy and yet you love God. You love God and you know how to make money. You love God and you know how to become an answer to a problem. You love God and you know how to shift society in a way that edifies Jesus. And, and so that's, that's what's unique. And I think that's what God wants us to see. He wants to show us something on a total different level. I'm, that's, I'm just telling you it's time now to learn to earn, learn to earn. Do you ever feel like you're stuck in a certain position in life? Here's the issue with every person who's stuck. You're not really stuck. You are just committed to a certain pattern of behavior that helped you in the past that's not helping you now. See, those behaviors that helped you in the past now have you stagnated now and they are harmful to you because you assume that this was good then and is good now. But the problem is this, is that what got you here won't get you there. And you're stuck because you're using antiquated weapons to fight a modern war. And so until the strategy changes, uh, you, you, you are applying the same old formula to a whole new level of your life. And it has you stuck because the things that used to work are no longer working. So you change the formula to get unstuck. There's something that you need to know. Every failure ultimately, generally, is a result of something that you need to know. Something that you need to know. That's why you study, 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 study. Prepare yourself. Learn to earn. Learn to earn. Learn to earn. Let me say this to you. The wise become wise because of their whys. I had to put that in writing for you so you could see it. So you didn't get it twisted. But the wise become wise because of their whys. When you understand why. It shifts you to another level. The, the line worker knows what to do. The manager, the supervisor knows how to do, but the owner who developed the product, the, the whole system, understands why. You have to understand the why. The whys know the whys. They ask the whys. Why? Why? Always follow the money. Ask the whys. Go to the end result of this thing. Look at it. Ask the whys. It'll give you an understanding into the problem. If, if a person is in a marriage and having issues with their spouse, instead of firing back at them and saying, you know, you got a problem too. You're only talking about me. What, what about this? And you didn't do. No, no, no. You might need to back up and say, why is this person responding to me in this way? Because their response to you is a signal, it is a message that there is an unmet need in my life. And because you're not meeting that need in my life, I am acting out. And this is my cry for attention. And if you understand why they are giving you this grief and giving you this drama, if you understand the why, now you can address the actual cough, the cause of the cough. Instead of treating the symptom, now you go to the cause, the root. The why always deals with the cause. If, 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 a, if a cat comes and sits on a hot stove, he learns a lesson and he will never sit on that stove again, hot or cold. Because they didn't understand why the stove burnt them in the first place. The only reason that it burnt them is because it, it had been on. But a cold stove hasn't been on. But if he doesn't understand the why, he's scared to sit on a hot stove or a cold stove. He's like, I don't want anything to do with the stove. Uh-uh, uh-uh. If a child has ever burned themselves, they, they, they touch something and they burn themselves, and they come back, and the mama says, I told you not to touch that. Hot baby, hot baby. And the next time that child comes up to that place, they're telling mama, my, hot, my, hot, hot. Understand the why. The wise ask the whys. The wise ask the whys. They want to ask the question, what's the root cause behind this? 
Learn to earn. Learn to earn. Here's what the Bible says. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 9. Notice this. With his mouth, the godless man destroys his neighbor. We know people how to tear down their neighbor with their mouth. But notice this. But through knowledge, the righteous will be delivered. Through knowledge. Through knowledge. Through knowledge, the righteous will be delivered. It's not through the anointing of the Holy Ghost coming upon you, speaking in tongues, dancing, shouting, getting your praise on. Through knowledge, the righteous will be delivered. Through knowledge, the only reason that some people don't tap into certain grants and things that are available to them is because they don't know it's available. They don't tap into certain markets and certain opportunities because they don't know it's available. The prophet Hosea said, my, God spoke prophetically and said, my people are destroyed for the lack of ideas. Destroyed for the lack of knowledge. For the lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Wonder why he's telling us study, study, study to show yourself. Learn so you can earn. They are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. The righteous shall be delivered through knowledge. If you're bound by something, if something has your hands tied, it simply means that there's something you need to know. Once you learn it, you'll break free. Once you learn it, you will break free. Learn to earn. you got to earn the right to be free. You have to earn your way to have a happy marriage. Because you have to learn the things that are the secrets that satisfy your partner. And so... Albert Einstein, he said, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. That means that we, we, are, we are destined to be lifelong learners. I want you to take a little look at a brilliant in interview by one of our recently departed friends, Sidney Poitier. Take a look. Okay, here's my big question. Mm -hmm. You couldn't read. You had a very thick Bahamian accent. I did. And you decide to try and become an actor? I did. Why didn't you go that route? It kind of makes no sense. I had no way of knowing that there is a madness to what I'm trying to do. After a disastrous audition with the American Negro Theater, where Poitier could barely read the script, an act of kindness at his job as a dishwasher changed his life. One of the waiters, a Jewish guy, elderly man. I had a, 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 a newspaper and he walked over to me and he looked at me and he said, what's new in the paper? And I looked up at this man and I said to him, I can't tell you what's up in the paper. I said, because I can't read very well. He says, let me ask you something. Would you like me to read with you? Wow. Uh, I said to him, yes. If you like. Now let me tell you something. Every night. Every night. The place is closed. Everyone's gone. And he sat there with me. Week after week after week. I learned a lot, a lot. And then things began to happen. Like landing an acting apprenticeship with the very same theater company that had laughed him out of his audition. Isn't it amazing that just somebody teaching him how to read so he could learn to earn. Can you imagine the roles that he never would have been able to do in to serve with love? Can you imagine the opportunities? This was his livelihood. This, is, this was his money maker, but he couldn't read. And all of this gift and talent and ability locked up in a dishwasher. And a Jewish man sat with him night after night after night and gave him a gift better than money. It was a knowledge because reading opens the door to all of the avenues of learning. Reading opens the door to all of the avenues of learning. But one of the strongest drives in the world is called hunger. You gotta be hungry.
You've got to be hungry. Had he not been hungry, after his shift ended, he would have said, I'm tired, I'm asleep, I'm ready to go home. But he was hungry. He was hungry for something beyond what a dishwasher's salary could pay him the wages of working as a dishwasher. He was hungry for more. Something on the inside of him knew that he was built for more. And he had a hunger to learn something that would change his earning capacity. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 15, notice what the word of the Lord says. Intelligent people are always ready to learn. Their ears are open for knowledge. Now notice this, intelligent people are always ready to learn. Their ears are open for knowledge. In other words, be a lifelong learner. Learner, Intelligence is not knowing it all, it's learning it all. It's having an attitude, a desire to want to learn it all. Don't be a know-it-all, be a learn-it-all. Be a learn-it-all. It may be out of your a specific area of, 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 of training or calling in life, but be, don't be a know-it-all, be a learn-it-all. Stay open. And please understand this, that the lessons that you learn should lead to new commitments in your life and new behavior. It's not to make you an egghead. God's not, in, in, he's not concerned with people being spiritual eggheads. I know some people that know a chapter and verse in the Bible, they can spit it out, they can do all this, they know every scripture, they know it and tell you, they can tell you the third degrees of it. But they can't demonstrate it. They can't put it into, in, into, into power. They can't translate it into anything. They know more scriptures than, than, than most ministers, and, and, but they can't translate it into something that means something in the world. Here's the truth that I want you to get. Application is the evidence of learning. Application is the evidence of learning. Application is the evidence of learning. Even if you didn't know anything else about Sidney Portier, the fact that he's able to read lines, memorize them, and execute them flawlessly on a screen was the evidence that he learned to read and read well. Because most people are shocked. I wanted to show you that clip because most people didn't know that he didn't know how to read. As a grown man, as a Bahamian who migrated to America and who was a pioneer and a door opener in so many different ways and he couldn't read and his destiny was limited until he studied, after he worked. And listen, even if you can't do what you want to do during the week, and if the weekend is your time, you work on your dream on the weekend. You work on your, on your dream as soon as you get off of your job. You start working on it. You start studying for it. You start researching. You start talking to people. You, you have to have this incredible, insatiable knowledge. And, and then there, there are some of us that are, are the Jewish guys that's got to sit there and teach the other people how to read financial things. Are you listening? We've got to teach them how to read things that teach them how to care for their own bodies. And we've got to teach them how to do this and how to do that. You need the people. God needs both of them. So if, if, you, if you've already been blessed, there's somebody who is desperate to learn a, a, a tenth of what you know. And, and you don't have to give them what you got, but you can teach them what you know. And, and, and so uh, don't try to give your children everything that you never had. Teach them what you never knew. It is a much more powerful gift. Don't merely try to give them what you never had. Teach them what you never knew. Teach them what you never knew. Now let me share this that I have learned. And I pray that you hear this with spiritual and prophetic ears. Because this is a revelation of the Holy Ghost. God never, hear me carefully, God never intended for success to be a satisfier. I want you to hear me very carefully. God never intended for success to be a satisfier. That's why successful people get bored. It's because God never intended for success to be a satisfier. God only intended for success. I want you to hear me carefully. God intended for success to be able to give you validation and to create a platform by which you would then empower others to launch forward. That's why you have success. Success gives you credibility. 
so that people will listen to you. It's a platform. It's not about football and about basketball and about soccer and about tennis and about golf and about being a movie star. Those things are just symbols of success that give you a credibility where people will listen to you. It builds a platform. Now once you've got the, the platform, success is to give you a platform of credibility so people will listen to you but it is designed so that as that platform is built now you can do the kingdom work that God really designed for you to do that you begin to impact the lives of others by building this thing and empowering them to launch forward to reach forward to hunger for more you begin to show them how to do this thing that once you've got everything that you need your platform now is built and now it is time for you to start empowering other people to say listen this is how you play this game Come Come and sit with me and I'll teach you some things. I'm going to teach you how to read the, the script in this life so that you'll be able to win because there are some things that you're going to need to know and not everybody is going to tell you and you're going to have to research it and you're going to have to be able to read this by yourself. And I can't teach you everything that you need to know but I can teach you how to read and once you learn how to read, you'll start getting empowered. I'm telling you, you use your platform of success. Success is not designed to be a satisfier. It's designed to help you to build your platform so that once your platform is built, now you begin to do the kingdom work of shifting for the glory of God and launching people and empowering them to be more than they are. That's what it's really all about. It's not about you. It's about what God wants to do through you. You are a vessel. You are an agent on assignment. God wants to bless you so that your needs are met so that now you can say, listen, it's not even about this stuff. King Solomon, the richest man, if they translated his money into billions and billions of dollars, King Solomon uh, would, would stand at the top of the list. And when he got to be about 70 years old, he began to do his writing. And he said all his material stuff, vanity. He used vanity more than any other word. Vanity, vanity, it's not about this, it's not about that. But once he had everything that everybody wished, he had all the women, he had all the women. I know you bad, but this man had 700 wives and 300 bed wenches. He had 700 wives and 300 bed wenches if he got tired of the wives. And then Solomon said, hey, listen to me. It ain't about these women in your bed. It ain't about all this gold. It's not about this material stuff. It ain't about the palace that you live in. He says, it's vanity, vanity. All of this is vanity. And he start directing people because all of that success only gave him credibility to be able to say, this mess here ain't nothing. This ain't it. What you're chasing, this is not it. Now he uses his platform of saying, here's the real meaning of life. Do good. Love mercy. Oh my God, he, this man took you in. He said, don't, don't spend your life chasing all of this, thinking that when you get this, you're going to be satisfied. I told you, success is not designed to be a satisfier. It's a platform that gives you credibility for you to do your kingdom assignment. That's all it is. Success is a platform for you to be able to empower others to want to stretch forward reach forward, become more than they are, so they start attracting more into their own lives. I hope you're learning something that, that is empowering you in a, in a unique way that is strengthening you to be who you, God has called you to be. And listen, because we live in such an era of rapid change, we must co commit ourselves to be lifelong learners. You know why? Because change screams for clarity. Change screams for clarity. And clarity is based on understanding. Clarity is based on understanding. And understanding is the result of clear communication and learning. I want you to get that real carefully. Because we live in such an era of rapid change, we must commit ourselves to being lifelong learners. Because change screams for clarity. Clarity is based on understanding, and understanding is the result of clear communication and learning. Our principles give us the clarity of the what. Principles give you the clarity of the what. Purpose gives you clarity of the why. 
and understanding of your God-given identity helps us to clarify the who. When you understand your God-given identity, you understand who you are. You understand your purpose. You understand what you, you know, why. You understand the why. The whys understand the why. And the principles help you to understand the what. And let me just say this to you. Every man who doesn't know why he exists, every woman who doesn't know why she exists, if you don't understand your why, please hear me by the Spirit, you will distract yourself with pleasure. When you don't know who you are, you will distract yourself with pleasure. When you don't know who you are, you will distract yourself with pleasure. And that's why the younger that people are, and when they have not come into a strong sense of their own identity, they aggrandize their own flesh through thinking drugs is feeling, just pleasure, women, pleasure. They're just trying to do some stuff just to pleasure themselves because they don't have an understanding of their purpose. They don't know their why. So they distract themselves with pleasure. It is a pain not to know why you exist. If you don't understand your purpose, your life is in pain. And to distract you from the pain, we use the anesthetic of pleasure. Pleasure. I pray that you're getting something from the word of the Lord. I really do. And here's the reason that I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this. It is because the quantity of knowledge is expanding exponentially in the earth. The quantity of, of, of knowledge is just expanding. That's so much. We have to be lifelong learners. Do you understand that, that there are over 3,000 books that are published every day? 3,000. 80% of the scientists and the engineers who ever lived in the world are alive today. 80% of them. 80%. Uh, the CEO at Google says that we are now creating as much data every two days as we did from the dawn of time up through 2003. Do you realize that more knowledge exists in one weekend edition of the New York Times than the average person has had access to in their entire lifetime in the 1800s? And 1.5 exabytes of information will be created this year. The prefix exa means one billion billion. That's more than was created in the previous 5,000 years. 1.5 exabyte of information is created this year. More than was created in the previous 5,000 years. And exa means a billion billion. One billion billion. And may I just say this to you, that in every area of life, the bar is being raised. In every area of life, the bar is being raised. Yesterday's best is today's norm. And today's norm will be tomorrow's subpar standard. Subpar standard. The shelf life of most of our knowledge that we have today is about 12 to 18 months. And after that, it's considered too dated to be cutting edge. And the main reason that we ought to be lifelong learners is really just for the sheer joy of it. You don't know what a joy it is. I, I, find, I find it enthralling to be a lifelong learner. Uh, I'm not a nerd, but I, I do enjoy learning new things. It, it, it just, it's fun to me. And, and, and here's why. You've heard me say it before. Never stop learning because life never stops teaching. Never stop learning because life never stops teaching. And you've heard me teach this principle that learning is a gift even when pain is the teacher. You learn some of your greatest and deepest lessons through some of your biggest painful mistakes. Why do you think that we need to be lifelong learners? Why? Why? Why do we need to be lifelong learners? It is because the world in front of us is nothing like the world that's behind us. 
You need to be a lifelong learner because the world in front of us is nothing like the world that's behind us. And can you imagine how many jobs are going into obsolescence where you no longer need them? They are just going into obsolescence. If you continue what you're doing, here's what will happen. You'll outgrow your current systems. If you continue what you're doing, you'll outgrow your current systems. And your competition will outdo you. And the market will outpace you. I want you to see that very clearly. If you continue what you're doing, you'll outgrow your current systems. Your competition will outdo you. And the market will outpace you. And I just want you to think about some companies that experienced this, that were thriving at one time. Anybody, I don't know whether you're old enough to remember the Kodak booths that used to be in the parking lots of different places that you could drop your film off and have it developed. And now you snap a picture and you turn and look at it and see if you don't like it, you delete it and take another one. But Kodak was the stuff. Everybody knew Kodak. Where are they today? You remember Blockbuster. And Netflix had this. Netflix said, hey, Blockbuster, I think I got an idea. Go take a look at it. Blockbuster laughing and says, catch me if you can. They said, we ain't got time for you little small time idea. They had a formula that worked there, but didn't work here. And they refused to change it. You either change or die. You either change or die. You either change or die. Die. Listen, please hear me carefully. You can have change or you can have growth. But you don't have both. If you, don't, if you refuse to change, you won't have growth. You either change or you die. The way we shop has changed. The way we enjoy content has changed. The way we date and meet potential mates now has changed. The way that we do research has changed. The way that we job hunt has changed. The way that we communicate has totally changed. And what do you do when you realize that the world that you have trained yourself for is rapidly disappearing? You keep learning and you reinvent yourself. Keep learning and you reinvent yourself. Keep learning and you reinvent yourself. Gandhi said it best when he says, live as if you were to die tomorrow and learn as if you were to live forever. Live as if you were to die tomorrow, but learn as if you were to live forever. And how does being a lifelong learner benefit us? Well, Mark Miller says this, that learning is the only sustainable competitive advantage. If you want a competitive advantage, in a business world, learning is the only sustainable competitive advantage. The Chinese have a proverb that says that learning is a treasure that will follow its owner everywhere. You get to carry your learning with you. It's transportable. It's transportable. Carry it with you wherever you go. Benjamin Franklin said, if a man empties his purse into his head, no one can take it away from him. And investment in knowledge always pays the best interest. Put it in your head. Nobody can snatch it out. And from the bishop here, unless change becomes the constant of our lives, we'll cease to be change agents in the lives of others. If you want to let God use your life to be able to change others, the way you say, God, I want to study to show myself approved unto God. And I pray that just by your tuning in today, that you feel like you've learned one thought, one concept, one idea, that something has sparked in you that has inspired you to study not only for the world in which we live, but remember, we are body, soul, and spirit. We are called, uh, the whole formula for success is that you learn, you do, you teach. You learn, you do, you teach. You learn, you do, you teach. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's the cycle of life. You learn, you do, you teach. If you don't learn anything, you can't do it. If you don't do it, you can't teach it. You're not qualified to teach it. That's why success builds the platform and gives you the credibility for you to be able to impact others and say, listen, there are people today that if I had Mark Zuckerberg here or Elon Musk here, 
if I had, uh, it was Amazon's founder, what's, what's his name, Jeff Bezos, if they were here, and I don't know, I have no knowledge that they, any of them has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But do you know if they said that they were coming, if I had them on a panel here at Word of Faith to share success principles, people would be running over the, over the they, they, they'd come here for it. They'd pay thousands of dollars just to have a seat to just try to learn something of what they know and they don't even claim to know Jesus. And what if God could somehow bless your life in such a magnificent way that one of them would want to come and say, you have all of this and there's a peace in your heart and you've got a joy and your marriage is intact. You've got something that I need. You will be surprised how God will want to do something in your life. And I, it's one of the deep, sad things to me is to find people who carry something and they don't even realize what they have and they downplay it. And when you don't realize what you have, you can't use it. There was an old homeless man in Chicago. It was a bitter cold time and He's rummaging around in, the, in a dumpster and, and, and he finds in it an old belt and he had on some big old oversized pants and he, he takes this belt out of the dumpster and puts it around his waist to hold up his big oversized baggy pants. It's cold and he's starving. He hasn't eaten in days. And I read in the paper, the man died. They found his body. He still had on the oversized pants with this belt that he had pulled out of the dumpster. And as they were analyzing the items on his person, they discovered that the belt that he had pulled out of the dumpster was what's called a money belt. And on the inside of it were hidden compartments. There was $23,000 in cash in the belt that was holding him, his pants up, and he died of starvation. And it makes me wonder how many people have on the belt of truth, girt about with truth, you know the truth, and you're dying of starvation. Turn your learning into earning. Realize what you've got and say, God, give me a vision that's bigger than who I am and where I am right now. God, show me. God, give me an insatiable appetite for your word, God, and help me to build a platform that will give credibility to my life so that others will come and listen so that I can teach them of you. And may I be able to use this, God, as an influence to be able to point people to Jesus Christ to say, this is not by might nor by power, but God, this is what you did. Even when I wasn't perfect and when I struggled and when I was having issues in my life and when I should have been disqualified, Lord, by your grace, by your mercy, by your love for me, by your long suffering, God, Jesus, this is what you did. And when you begin to say, listen, I've done this and I've been graced to do this, not because I was perfect or flawless, but because of God's incredible, amazing grace, that this is by the divine hand of God that has been on my life. And if God could redeem me and use me, then maybe there's something in you that you don't let the failures of your yesterday and the failures of your past disqualify you, that you don't let the family lineage out of which you have come, even if that your mama was crazy and if your daddy had addiction issues, you can say, God, I am the seed of the righteous and may this thing now start with me. May I now leave a legacy for my children even though one was not left for me. My God, God is looking for people that are not mealy-mouthing and complaining about what you didn't get. May you become the giver of the very thing that you didn't get yourself. It's time now to rise up in truth and say, I didn't, I didn't receive an inheritance, but when you die, leave a legacy. Leave an inheritance. May you become the progenitor so that you give the very thing that you wish that somebody had done for you. May God increase your territory. May He increase your mindset. May He increase your ideas. May He increase your anointing. May God, may the hand of God so come on you in strength 
in power. May you learn, may you earn, and may you point people to the glory of Jesus to say this is the Lord's doing. This is the Lord's doing. Not because I'm good, Lord, but because you are good. This is the Lord's doing in my life. It is that time that where we give ourselves to Him and we say, God, whatever you see in me, search me, God. Know my thoughts. Try me, Lord, and know my ways. And if there's anything wicked in me, expose it, God. Burn it out of me. Deliver me from it. Deliver me. Deliver me, Lord. So that you build a platform of credibility to say that in spite of everything that I've been through, in spite of every mistake I've made, in spite of every bad decision, in spite of my family tree, in spite of my lineage, in spite that I didn't get a trust fund, in spite of the fact that I didn't get an inheritance, God, now may you empower us to be those that will leave an inheritance. Give us a revelation, God. Fill us with a hunger. Oh God, that we might be workmen who show ourselves approved to you, Lord, that we may be approved by you, saying you meet the qualifications, empowered by your spirit, taught by your word, delivered through your knowledge, strengthened by your truth, set free by your truth. May you do the work in us, oh God, to transform us so that our lives are never, ever the same. Oh, God, have your way in our lives. Begin to move, Lord. Expose. Turn the searchlight of your word on. Show us our ignorance. Show us our lack, God, so we'll know what we need to work on. Show us the skinny parts of our legs that need to be developed so we'll know how to exercise that part and bring it in, 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 into compliance. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that we'll be pleasing to you, pleasing workmen that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing your truth. Father, give us clarity in our perception of the truth not according to our own interpretation but Father that we be able to perceive your voice that we hear you so that we become unified as one family oh God strengthen us show us God that we are our brother's keeper Father may you give us a grace to sit down with those who don't know how to read the scriptures and explain it to them no matter how long it takes and that we break it down to them Lord may you empower us God to take what little we get and start sharing it along the way. Lord, don't let us wait until we have so-called made it before we start sharing the truth that has set us free on the journey of where we are right now. May we start sharing it right now, sharing it right now, because we can only become what we are already becoming. And Father, I pray that you empower every man, every woman, every household to become a representative of you, to become a work person who will work to show themselves approved so that we meet your approval. Meet your approval, God, because we want to come to that place to where we hear you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Father, we give ourselves to you today and we say, work something in us. Change us, O oh God. We pray again, God, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. As it is in heaven. In the name of Jesus. Father, we pray that a new revival of miracles, 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 inexplicable things that will happen. Sometimes it's the miracle to even be able to retain things that our minds couldn't remember before. Father, may this be a season of miracles, miracles, miracles. Season of miracles, Lord. Open doors, Father, in the name of Jesus and heal relationships. A season of miracles, a revival of miracles, miracles, a revival of miracles of your miraculous hand moving in among, among us, restoring minds and bodies and families and relationships, rebuilding and restoring us, calling us back to the dreams and the ambitions that you put in our hearts because we delighted ourselves in you and you, Lord, now are giving us the desires in our hearts that have come from you. Empower us, God to be what you called us to be. And thank you, Jesus, that you didn't make success a satisfier because you're the one who ultimately satisfies our lives. And Father, after we have you, may we be able to point people to you and show them 
our faith, God, by our works. Thank you for gracing us to be who and what you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb. I pray you got something out of the word of the Lord today, and it's been worth your time. And Share it with somebody. Share the word with somebody. Tag somebody. Give it away. Give it away. Teach it and bless them with it. And let God be glorified, Lord of all in your life. May his grace rest upon you in great strength, victory, peace, and power. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.